I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. And this is the I Hate Politics candidate interview with Hans Riemer from Montgomery County Executive. I'm Sunil Dasgupta, host of I Hate Politics. Hans Riemer is a three-term and term-limited council member in Montgomery County, challenging the incumbent county executive, Mark Elrich. Riemer has positioned himself in the middle between Mark Elrich, who Riemer describes as being a naysayer, and David Blair, the Rockville businessman, also running for county executive, but without direct experience in government. I talked to Reamer about the county's pandemic response, on which Elridge has staked his re-election claim. Music for this episode comes from Carol Lovchenko, an Arlington-based singer-songwriter who is the choir director at Centerville High School in Fairfax, Virginia. I'll make some bread, but instead I am stuck in my head. Forgot about the way it felt when we'd say hello. Are you? Cause these days we ain't doing so well. This is my quarantine song. Everything feels wrong, but I know it will be okay. Just maybe not today. There's so much I miss. It's hard to pick, but I think... Hans Riemer, welcome to I Hate Politics. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. You wanted to talk about pandemic response in the county. County Executive Mark Elrich has made a case for his re-election based on the performance of his administration in response to the pandemic. What is your view of how the county has done? Well, I think the county residents have been meticulous about following best practices. You know, I think our community is one where people are really intent on staying safe and and building a safe community. So when vaccinations came out, Montgomery County residents were willing to travel all over the state to get vaccinated when they couldn't get vaccinated in Montgomery County. Uh, You know, Montgomery County residents generally wearing masks. Um, you know, avoiding gatherings. We're doing everything we can to be safe. And that's working. You know, we are a safe, safer community and we have a much lower death toll and, you know, serious illness toll than communities that, you know, were in COVID denial. Um, and so I think the community itself has, has been successful. And I think what else we should do expect from, a county that is, you know, have a large share of people who live here work for the NIH. They work for the FDA. Uh, they work for the Federal Department of HHS and and other. Uh, you know, we have a huge medical uh, establishment here in the county. So highly educated. Um, so I, you know, I think absolutely. Uh, so, you know, uh, the county has done very well. Um, what of that is actually the county government's doing, you know, versus the community and the, and the people who live here? I think it's much more the community and the people who live here. There has been some successes, no doubt. I don't want to, you know, take away uh, where it's appropriate. But um, I also think the county government has been slow, uh, behind the curve a lot, um, and could have done things more effectively. So the fact that we never got a mass vac site, you know, because the probably because of the bad blood between the county executive and the governor, Um, you know, just general confusion and and lack of coordination with the state. You know, it's like amazing to see major policy issues debated on Twitter um, between the county and the state, Uh, the lack of focus on schools and education. If the county executive can make the case that, you know, his government is what led to uh, lower death rates, for example, in the county. 
that's a pretty powerful argument. Or is it the case that you think that the county executive did not do anything in that regard? Well, I mean, I certainly don't think the county executive deserves a ton of credit for the vaccination rate of the county. I mean, wh- why, why should he? You know, I, I think it's not that different from other communities that have our same characteristics. And I think when you really look at it hard, you got to remember for months and months and months, most people got their vaccinations outside of Montgomery County. So why would the county executive of Montgomery County get credit for people who got who went to Baltimore to get vaccinated? You know, now, I think there is a very general sense that there's been a terrible divide in this country between communities that have tried hard to l- reduce and limit COVID and communities that have just been in denial. And, you know, I think certainly the county executive is hoping that that's what this election is about is, Hey, we are, we are a community that have, has tackled COVID. So vote for, vote for me. But, um, you know, again, I, I think by June, we're going to be in a very different environment. And, um, I think the COVID experience for people has been rocky. You know, it's not just a, this is not a, as, as political in the way it used to be. And I think this election is going to really be about issues that people, you know, are concerned about, like jobs and schools and housing and transportation and so on. Okay. Um, let's talk about schools because, you know, a big part of the county's pandemic response was in the schools. Um, And that's the only, you know, congregate setting that we allowed um, during, you know, sometimes during high rates of uh, higher rates of infection. Um, How do you think the schools did in terms of uh, pandemic response? What do you think was the relationship between the county and the school system over that well, I think this has not gone well. You know, I think that the county's record here has left the community shaken. And I think it has undermined the confidence of this county in our ability to have a successful public education. I, I think it's that serious. I think it has not gone well at all. This school year, the, the return to school in September was, was not good. You know, we started off the year with thousands of kids immediately getting sent home. And due to, to, to the particular guidance that came from the Montgomery County Health Department, the school system had to kind of work its way out of those policies in order to allow for the school year to start. And then when word came out about Omicron is coming, which is, you know, we know it's going to be a significant wave. I, I think the county government and the school system did not have a strong program at the table, figuring out what to put in place to make that work. And I think the result was January arrived and, you know, the, uh, the mitigation measures weren't sufficient. The public health guidance was incredibly confusing. The communications was, uh, you know, not executed very smoothly. And it just, uh, it was, it didn't go well at all. And I think that a lot of that was just due to the lack of active management by the county government. I know a lot of people have been uh, upset with the school system for it, but I don't think there's really necessarily as much appreciation for the fact that a lot of what the school system was doing was um, working through guidance that was provided to them by the county, often guidance that was different from what the state was providing. And so the school system was trying to figure out how do you operate schools when, you know, uh, you'll remember the 5%, you know, red, yellow, green, um, you know, the the quarantine guidelines that were keeping staff at home, all those things makes it incredibly difficult to operate a school system. And I think the county executive and I think the executive branch generally uh, had a lot to do with how rocky that was. But you said, um, you know, this 5% uh, threshold that the school system adopted temporarily in January, is, th- is that in your understanding, that came from the county government and not the school system itself? 
That's correct. Yeah, that was that was guidance provided to them from the county, just the same as the f- September guidance was provided to the school system from the county. Um, and it's just, you know, wasn't really thought through. And, it, you know, I it was a problem and I, I identified that problem. You know, I, I saw that in December. I said, where where is this heading? This is going to be a huge, huge issue in January. And they stuck to it. And, you know, they also didn't do the things that w- would have been necessary. Like, let's get the KN95 masks. Let's order the, you know, the child fitting KN95 masks and let's have them all ready for January's return. You know, they, they just, they weren't thinking along those lines. I don't think they were thinking about even how to keep the schools open as much as they should have been. And, and what do you put in place in order to keep the schools open? I think they were unsure about whether the schools were going to stay open in the first place. And I think that led to a lot of confusion internally. So when the county council sits as the board of health, right, does it not deliberate on issues such as the 5% rule or the, you know, other guidance or is I mean, it seems like incredible sometimes. Uh, and, and for somebody that is outside the system, there's, you know, we can't figure out who's doing what to whom. I mean, who is right. responsible? Well, no, we don't deliberate on things like isolation guidelines or quarantine guidelines. We don't, I don't know that we've ever really deliberated on, uh, like, I don't think we've ever passed a board of health regulation that specifically affected schools uh why not have well that's really not our authority you know that's the school board's authority but why why couldn't the county executive say the same thing and say you know it's a school board's duty to figure out when to close the schools and not to close schools well you know i think the executive could take a far more hands-off approach and that probably also would have worked better than what we got but what the state framework is really that the school board is supposed to work with the local board, the local medical uh, chief medical officer and the HHS, uh, you know, they're supposed to f- listen to the guidance of the county. It does not mean that they are obligated to always do exactly what it says, but that's the sort of framework that the state establishes is that the school system isn't expected to have its own health expertise it's not expected to have that it's supposed to look to the county for it and as a result you know there there's a partnership there that's really 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 important and the county government has just a critical role in ensuring the successful implementation of of school and that, that's why i'm saying i think that the county executive really was hands off for the return to school in september and the return to school in January, and like didn't actively make that the top priority, how to make it sure it happened. And I just thought that was, um, you know, really wrong. I mean, th- what could have been more important to this county than coming back to school in September after the debacle of distance learning last year, to come back in September to have a successful start of the year? Like, what higher priority could we possibly have in this county? Okay, so the framework that is laid out by the state has the Health and Human Services Department as the nodal agency that leads on health expertise um, on schools, right? But we know that the that DHHS has been in upheaval. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and so uh, you know, um, what are you? What do you know about what's going on in the Health and Human Services Department? You know, we don't have a replacement for. Dr. Travers Gales. So Dr. Gales was our chief health officer. And, um, you know, he, in fairness, I think he was the source of very conservative health guidance, uh, you know, that had a huge impact on schools. Um, And, you know, since his departure, the county has not been able to fill that position. Um, And, Dr. Bridgers, who has been his number two and is a very, very capable guy, um, but ultimately is, is not a doctor and I think has a little bit less ability to make 
I, w- what I think are independent judgments about um, health guidance. I know it's been challenging within the county government, probably nowhere more than HHS, because that's been the, the center of the storm. And I, I, think, I think we should all just frankly be grateful and appreciative for the incredible efforts that everyone in that department has made. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think that the guidance that has had a huge influence over all of these policy areas, there's just a lot of judgment calls involved. And I don't think the county executive has participated in that um, constructively. And I think that we haven't, you know, I think that's just why we've been behind the curve. Do you know why we don't have a replacement for Travis Gaines yet? Um, I mean, I don't, I can't tell you why exactly. You know, I, I have talked to a couple of people who said that they were going to apply, you know, uh, to be fair, I, it could be that anyone with a degree at this point who's available, you know, maybe they've just got better options. Um, I mean, what could be a better option than working for one of the largest, most richest counties in the United States? Well, I mean, it's COVID, you know, I mean, it's not an easy time to be a public health official. Sure, but it's not an easy time to be a public health official anywhere in Maryland or anywhere in the country. And, and assume, I assume that we have the resources and, you know, you pointed out a population that, you know, is so, you know, healthcare oriented works in NIH and uh, whatever other profession that people would want to be here. Yeah. I mean, I, wouldn't you want to be Dr. Fauci's, uh, you know, public health officer uh, for the for the county where he lives? Um, I would That's think right. That, that would be so. Wh- so what is wh- I don't understand what is holding this up to the point where MCPS decided to have to hire its own health officer, which, of course, it hasn't yet. Well, uh, but MCPS wanted to hire its own health officer because they need they wanted the ability to make their own decisions and maybe make some better ones than what they were the guidance they were getting from the county um and they also haven't filled that position yet but um yeah i don't know i mean i think it's frustrating i i you know i it could be that qualified candidates take a look at county government and they say that that's doesn't seem to be a place where i want to be right now i i can't explain it well to be i mean i have heard some pretty horrific stories um about what the morale is in um hhs right now uh i've you know uh, even during when travis gales was um chief medical officer he let so many of the contact tracers go early in 2021 and then of course we got hit and then we were looking for contact tracers then mcps has to get contact tracers i mean there seems to be nobody in charge for a long long time yeah well i I always thought we should build a different kind of contact tracing team, you know, like involve volunteers in that effort, you know, maybe shift librarian, library staff and, and others more into that effort. Um, But uh, yeah, I I think it's tough within HHS, that's for sure. And, um, you know, I think generally it, it, you know, the, the, the confusion, particularly in relation to the state, you know, to see the county make a claim about, oh, well, we're doing this longer period of isolation because that's what the state says we should do. And that's why all the staff are at home. And then somebody asks the state, like, well, why are you doing that? And the state says, that's not our guidance. We don't say that. You know, that, that, that kind of thing has been happening. And it's just, uh, you know, I, I think that is inexcusable. There's just, uh, there hasn't been a constructive partnership in a close partnership with the state. And I certainly think not having a chief health officer is part of that. You know, the the health officer is the top official responsible for working with the state. So I think you'd have more attention and focus on those kinds of questions if we had a chief health officer in place. I did an episode in October 2021 with MCPS's COVID coordinator, And one of the things that came out of that conversation was that MCPS and the Department of Health and Human Services did not have an MOU that covered COVID. Now, MCPS and HHS have 
a range of MOUs that cover everything from nurses to condom distribution, but nothing for this emergency, nothing for COVID. Why do you think that's the case? Right. Well, I think because it hasn't been a priority for the county executive. I just don't think the county executive has made it his top priority to ensure success with the schools. You know, I think he's been more content to sit back and let them figure it out and then try to avoid, you know, being in the spotlight if it doesn't go well. And that's just not what we need. We need the executive to be responsible for this problem and to get his hands in there and fix it. So you said the county executive was absent from these deliberations. So in the absence of the county executive, did the county council have a role in stepping up and fixing the problem? What we're talking about here is like day-to-day, hour-to-hour management. And that's not really the county council's role. Uh, You know, county council is supposed to consider community feedback and vote on high level regulations, you know, public health orders. Um, you know, we're not supposed to be convening the, the hourly, you know, weekly meetings on how all of these things are getting implemented. You know, that's really what you have the executive branch for. The childcare situation is another really good example. It's very similar to, uh, you know, the general schools issue. You know, we're hearing from <clears throat> so many families that, uh, you know, particularly from women who are out of vacation, out of leave, uh, at risk of losing their jobs, certainly feeling like they are, you know, their value to their workplace is being questioned by their employers. And they have a healthy kid who, you know, is being sent home for 10 days uh, because that kid was in the same room as somebody you know, who might, you know, essentially for an exposure, but they're testing negative. And so basically they're forced once again to spend 10 days with their healthy child who is, you know, not sick and they can't do it anymore. You know, it's been two years of this and it's not fair. Like they need to be able to live a life here and and work and, you know, strengthen their own future and let their kid have, time in a classroom. Um, So what would you do? Well, I I would do what I've been saying to do for weeks, like stop, you know, align our childcare guidance with the CDC. I mean, that's the point here. Our childcare guidance is stricter than the CDC. Why? Why is that? Who do you think is influencing this decision? Well, it's funny you should ask. So, I mean, I actually pushed pretty hard on this. So there is, you know, Dr. Bridgers, this guidance has been brought to the county from a group of, um, you know, an advisory group that uh, has provided recommendations to HHS. What is this advisory group? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's the, it's, I mean, I think the official name might be public health advisory group. They're they're a small group of doctors or public health officials. They've been advising the county for some time. And, you know, their, their guidance is, at this point, significantly different from the CDC or the Maryland Department of Health or the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania or the, you know, American Medical Association. Um, and yet that's what the county has been foisting on to child care providers and, you know, schools and, and so forth. Okay, so in a little while ago, you said that you need a doctor to be the chief medical officer because they can make an independent determination of what needs to be done. But now when, this, when the doctors on this public health advisory group are making an independent decision, you're saying, no, they're wrong. The point is the chief medical officer can work with the county executive and the department heads and the county council and try to find the right kind of health recommendation that balances the different community needs. That's been the challenge throughout the whole pandemic. That's a challenge for everybody is to find that line. We don't only do the thing that is COVID zero. And so a chief medical officer, you know, a family doctor can sort of say, yes, you know, this might increase risk a little bit, but I, I, I think it's 
better for you because actually you have other factors in your life that are also really important. They can look at the whole patient, essentially. That's what a medical, a chief medical officer can better do is take the advice of an advisory board, but also consider that bigger picture and be accountable to the public. You know, the, the, this advisory board is not accountable to the public. I think the chief medical officer is striving to make public policy that balances, you know, really difficult equities and, you know, can sort of weigh, okay, well, you know, there's some group of kids that we've seen a huge rise of, of attempted suicide. You know, that's a major public health problem that's part of this pandemic. You know, it's not only COVID. How do you balance those two things together? When Travis Gales was the chief medical officer, he was, and you described him as being conservative in his uh, opinion about how long to keep the schools closed, for example. Do you think he was also being solicitous of the same public health group and that's what led to that? I don't know who was on that group at that time. It's possible. I think generally the point here is that having a chief medical officer gives us somebody who can see a bigger picture and help the county grapple with the whole public health uh, challenge of COVID, which has many dimensions. What do you think we ought to do about the staffing shortages? Without resolving the staffing shortages, we can't really resolve the issue of opening, closing and all of it. Exactly. You know, I think that it's great that we got some, uh, you know, a, a framework worked out for substitute teachers, for example. Uh, that took far too long. I mean, I think it's an 8% uh, increase. Yeah, I don't even know. Is it enough? Um, <laughs> it's not enough. You know, yeah, and even exactly. then, it's not going to find you the teachers. Right. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, it's been frustrating. I mean, the school system, the county, we have been showered with emergency relief funding. And, and when it comes time to spend it on the emergency, you know, where is it? Um, you know, is it sitting in a bank account somewhere? You know, what more important use could we have for school related COVID money than ensuring that we can actually teach kids in the, in the classroom. You know, that's what the money's for. And, you know, I, again, I think that gets back to like, okay, so if successfully reopening the schools is the top priority, how are we going to do that? You know, let's talk through health mitigation measures like testing and air quality and masking, and let's talk through staff shortages. And how are we going to anticipate that? What are we doing now to make sure that we actually have backup bus drivers and you know available substitute teachers um you know the you know that that really wasn't on the county executive's mind what he actually said was sort of the opposite when he was criticizing my proposal to uh require vaccinations for the county workforce you know and i i had cited the school system which had a pretty strong vaccination requirement too uh and his take on that was well you know there's substitute teachers uh, but there's no substitute police officers, uh, you know. So uh, I just think that there was a lack of focus on how the workforce issues were really going to evolve and what after a couple of years of COVID, you know, would be coming down the pike. And it's just not been going well. You have proposed a vaccination mandate for county employees. Where is the holdup on that? Yeah, well, Mark Elrich is the whole up and the county, the leadership of the county employee unions. With Omicron, you know, came a massive staff impact. And what we know from everywhere is that, uh, you know, the unvaccinated were having far worse health impacts than people who are vaccinated. And they were more likely to be out. They were more likely to get sick, seriously sick. And so, the county executive had opposed our vaccination requirements saying, well, I don't want to take a risk that we're going to lose some personnel. And then along came Omicron and we had to reduce fire service because we had such a huge staff shortage, like so many people were out. And, you know, if we had had that vaccination requirement, I think that that would have been lessened. You know, I think we would have been able to have more fire coverage and police coverage through that wave and you know we've got to get that vaccination requirement passed because guess what omicron's probably coming back next year or else another variant you know is coming along soon and 
we've got to be prepared for that. So having a fully vaccinated workforce is an essential part of maintaining these critical services. We know from places that have implemented strong requirements that, you know, 96 percent, 95, 96, 97, or even 99 percent of the employees will get vaccinated. That the number who decide that they would rather quit or retire is so small. It's just really, really, really small. Are you talking about Rockville City and Tacoma Park? Is is that what you're talking about when you say others have done this? Uh, no, I was referring to examples like state of Massachusetts, state of Washington, um, you know, the Park and Planning Commission. I know that Rockville has in, indeed, as you said, put in a strong requirement. I think Tacoma Park has now as well. Um, you know, they're not everywhere, but they are. They are definitely used and we also had private sector examples like some of the airlines and hospital systems um you know it's the vaccination requirements have been used a lot especially in essential industries what is the support for that measure on the council itself and couldn't you do it without the executive well what we propose legislation so yes we can do it without exec the executive i think that if at any point it had come to a vote i think it would have passed you know by a majority but i i know that there are council members uh who have criticized it or, or tried to explain that it wasn't necessary council member hucker uh i think council member katz you know there has been um real criticism of of the requirement and um so it's not necessarily unanimous. What do you think of vaccination mandate for students in school? I mean, I've always been appreciative of the vaccination requirement for measles and polio. You know, it, it's a really effective system and nobody complains about it. And all these people who are complaining about the COVID vaccination have never, you know, almost almost entirely have never complained about their kids getting vaccinated uh, to go to school, which I think proves that a lot of the opposition to the vaccinations is really political and not health oriented, unfortunately. So, you know, I think it's necessary. I, I would support a vaccination requirement to return to school um, as well as, you know, whatever the FDA, I, I think it's reasonable to wait for the full authorization. I think we got to get ready for the winter in a big way. I mean, I would say all else being equal, COVID would be worse next year than this year because what we know is the problem is waning immunity. And so, uh, you know, five months after you're, you get your booster, you're going to need another one. Or if you haven't gotten a booster by next winter, you're going to be, you know, it's going to be uh, even harder for your body to fight it off. So presumably, unless there is some kind of huge new vaccination initiative in the fall, like maybe we get a new vaccine that actually defeats all coronavirus variants or one that truly defeats uh omicron um you know but absent that you know we're gonna have to have like a huge campaign in the fall in order to get people to boost their immunity coming into the winter and you know we got to be planning to, for things to change and certainly a fall vaccination requirement for students would be helpful in that regard do you have a sense of who is not vaccinated in the county at this time? I mean, we are what, 92, 93 percent of, of vaccination rate of eligible, uh, you know, uh, folks who is not vaccinated. Do you have a sense of that? I'm sure that it's much like it is elsewhere. There's a pretty strong partisan uh, divide. Um, in other words, you know, the unvaccinated at this point are going to be substantially more Republican than the rest of the county. But unfortunately well, you know what's more important to look at is who hasn't been boosted and our boosting rate is not that high you know we're not really a, a standard. what is our here. boosting rate it's about 50 percent you know first of all everyone can get a booster now um and that you've been everyone's been eligible for a long time so we're not doing that well on that and we're really far closer to the earlier stages of the vaccination campaign where only the most uh, motivated or highly educated residents uh, had and were vaccinated. And the boosting campaign has not reached. We have the same racial inequities uh, or disparities that we had 
earlier in the pandemic with vaccinations um you know there's just it's uh it's very uneven so we've got a long way to go on boosters and you know that's that's really where we need to be putting a lot more of our effort this is a national problem you know every community is lagging on boosting the whole country is lagging on boosting you might have seen some of the charts this morning actually in the new york times um showing how america's boost rate is so much lower than every other you know advanced country and as a result our death rate is way higher you know omicron has had a huge impact here that it did not have in european countries um because we're just very low on boosting and why is that yeah i think it's because the politics of COVID. you know it's because the extreme partisanship and extreme hostility to tackling the pandemic and embracing the solutions that are effective and but we're talking about montgomery county it's yeah. three fourths registered democrats i know but i think that stuff carries through you know i think the lack of consensus around vaccination here unfortunately bleeds beyond just those who are partisan you know and and seeps into the consciousness of everybody and I think it creates reticence among a lot of people to get boosted. That's interesting because you started this interview complimenting the residents of this county for being educated, for being health oriented and getting vaccinated. And now we've come a full circle to say that, well, these guys are not listening anymore. Do you hold the county executive administration any responsible for that part or is it just a national problem and we are part of the stream i think it's a little bit more of a national problem i would put the balance to that um but hey i mean fighting against a vaccination requirement for county employees doesn't send a good message about the importance of vaccination or the idea that we're all in agreement about them. There certainly have been shortcomings here. Hans Streamer, thank you for coming on I Hit Politics. Good luck in the campaign. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Are the shows my longing for live music grows? This is my quarantine song. Everything feels wrong, but I know it will be okay. Just maybe not today. It'll be okay one day. That was Hans Streamer from Montgomery County Executive. This interview will not tell you everything you want to know about him, but hopefully shows you his thinking and approach to governance on a particularly important issue. You can find out more about him at HansRemer.com and you can follow him on Twitter at Hans Reamer. Music for this episode comes from Arlington-based singer-songwriter Kara Levchenko, who is a choir director in Centerville High School in Fairfax County, Virginia. See you next time. I can